I don't care if God ever shows me that this is for my good. I get to believe it. It's part of me. It's down in my toes. It's what the Bible says. Don't take that away from me. If, if God takes all, it takes everything, leave me the scriptures and don't let me ever doubt them. Larry, his teachings meant the world to me. Best man I ever met. He showed me the person that I need to be, but through his teachings, I figured out the man that I really want to be. I sure want to be Christ-like, just like Larry. Welcome to the Timeless Gospel Podcast. I'm your host, Faith Ann, and Larry Horton was my dad. The deepest connection I had with my dad was through his teaching of the gospel. My dad communicated grace more deeply and simply than most. These sermons came to be preserved through my dear Aunt Shirley, who, in the early 80s, requested that my dad's sermons be recorded on cassette tapes and mailed to her so that she could be edified from five states away. When Larry died and went home to be with the Lord in 2019, my Aunt Shirley came to the funeral and brought with her the very sermons this podcast was created to showcase. The remaining sermons were preached in the early 2000s at the church he pastored until he died. His children's prayer is that you will come to Christ through these sermons, or if you already are a Christian, be edified and comforted as so many were during his life. In episode 5 of The Timeless Gospel, Larry begins his teaching on the wrath of God, starting in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. When the episode finishes, I'll tell a brief story about growing up with Larry as my pastor, not just my dad. I would love to hear your feedback on the podcast so far. Email me at thetimelessgospel at gmail.com. That's thetimelessgospel at gmail.com. But we have before us in these next 63 verses, 64 verses. 63 verses, the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the hatred of God. And these are just not, uh, I'm just not comfortable with this. So I I ask that you pray for me, that God will will give me the ability to get through this passage. I feel that uh, the hatred of God, that the wrath of God is very much been a uh, something of a past. In our preaching, we can read the old Puritans and we can see the wrath of God and it uh, brings us to repentance. But in today's church, and I'm afraid, uh, sorry to say in my own life, it's something that's almost uh, non-existent. We do not talk about or preach about the wrath of God. We were constantly preaching and teaching on the love of God, but you cannot have the love of God without the wrath of God. It's, It's not fair to the hearers. It's not truth. God is love only is untrue. There is a wrath of God. John 3, 16. We declare to everyone, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But you can change a word there without changing the meaning at all. And many times I paraphrase John 3, 16 as God so hated sin that he gave his only begotten son. Same meaning, same thing. We're getting away from the wrath of God. We, 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 it's no longer concerned with the judgment of God. That's number one. So it's very difficult for me because I, I certainly like to teach on other subjects. And again, this is why it's so important for the, for the, the one who is trying to communicate the word of God to, to take it verse by verse, passage by passage, and not skip around. Because if I could skip around, I would not be teaching this this morning. And yet the apostle Paul felt it strong enough to, to put it here. The Holy Spirit felt it was strong enough, felt strongly enough about this to put it here. So we need to go through it. Now, that's number one. Number two, the light. Number two, and this is very important for each one of us. Very important for each one of us. Don't take this passage and move it way back over before the flood or over in the Old Testament somewhere during Isaiah's day. This is for you and I today. In our nature, what this is saying here, all these things that we're going to get into, is talking about me and it's talking about you as believers as far as our old nature is concerned, our human nature. So don't discount this, this passage. Just don't, don't say, yes, that was that's for the heathen over in Africa. That's, that's for uh, the, the heathen out in the woods in Isaiah's day. Don't do that, please. Internalize it to your own self. This is who you are. Before God in your old nature. This is who you are before God 
as far as the result of all of the the product that your mother and father produced. What would you think of me if I uh, went down to Western Union? So well, I like to go to work for you folks uh, delivering uh, telegrams. That's been uh, my purpose for my life. I just want to work for Western Union and deliver telegrams. But I want to tell you right now, uh, all the good news in the, in the telegrams the, 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 about the weddings and about, about inheritances and all these things, I'll deliver those. But all the telegrams that have bad news in them, all the telegrams that are sad, uh, all the telegrams that brings about uh, uneasiness, tears, uh, I'm just going to throw those away because I don't want to bother the people. I don't want to. Well, that, you know, they would not hire me. And so as a, as a, a communicator, whether it be a preacher or a teacher or, or anyone else, of the word of God needs to give the whole, the whole story. And we're over here giving all the good news. And I like what the old Puritan said. This says, God has commanded us to preach the good news. But he has not commanded us to preach it first. And if you don't need the good news, you're not going to have any need for it. Of course. So you preach. You, you must communicate the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the, 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 the hatred of God, in order to contrast it with the love of God. So let's remember that. We're going to go through some. All this is negative. Now, as far as exit. Jetical uh, information as far as how we're going to go through this. Remember this, because we're going to have some problems over here in the, in the latter part of chapter two. We don't understand that from 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 verse eighteen all the way down to to three twenty. We're talking about the judgment of God. Please do not try to bring salvation into this passage. If you try, as many do, to bring salvation into this passage passage, you have salvation by works. You have blessing by works, and we'll get to that later. But everything that we're going to say from now to verse to chapter 320 is talking about the judgment of God. And as I mentioned in my uh, in my uh, introduction, if you look at verse 20 of chapter 3, uh, excuse me, verse 19 of chapter 3, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed. This is where Paul is heading. He's going to, he's heading to the place where every mouth will be closed before God. Now, if you look over in verse, we're going to deal with it this morning, uh, verse uh, 20 of chapter 1, so that, the last part, so that they are without excuse. We are now entering in, as I told you, this was a law book. This is a legal courtroom presentation through Romans. It's being presented by an attorney, and we're going to we're going to see the the, the 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 enormous ability of Paul to argue, and Paul is going to argue for a lot of different things. But right now, Paul is taking up the the uh, the responsibility of the prosecuting attorney, and now he's going to he he is he is presenting his case before the judge, and this is the case. So we're going to look at it. In terms of, of law, in terms of the legal aspect, we want to see all the different reasons, all the different evidence why man stands before God without excuse. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes come. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile. In their speculations and their foolish hearts were dark. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. For the wrath of God is revealed uh, uh, from heaven. Where's the righteousness of God revealed, by the way? Does anybody know? On the cross, going back maybe to last week, in the gospel. Righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed faith to faith, just a little bit. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The wrath of God, now there are two words for wrath in the scriptures. One is thermos. 
<coughs> what might thermos mean? <laughs> means we have the company that's built up an empire on that name. Means hot, means violent, the eruption, it's volcanic. And, and we get this idea of the wrath of God. We're all very much aware of this kind of wrath, the, the volcanic eruption of God, the anger of God, our own anger. We understand that word, but that's not what the word is here. The word here is orga, which, which has to do with plants and flowers and fruit. It has to do with when the, the, the flower blooms, when the flower wraths, when the flower blooms, when the, when the juice, when, when, when the fruit is so juicy that it, 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 it blooms, it blossoms, the, the wrath of the fruit, the wrath of the flower. When it blooms, it's it's a it's a long suffering. God is long suffering. We we, we think of the wrath of God is going to come to us uh, instantly. No, it, it's been long suffering. Paul said it in, in Acts that the the sin of the former times God winked at. God did not pour out His wrath, and because because God does not judge us and judge the world instantly in His wrath, we think we're getting away with something. And we, we, we tend to forget, uh, even as believers, we tend to forget about the wrath of God, the subject of the wrath of God. The wrath of God cannot ever touch me because I'm in Christ. But the subject of the wrath of God, because I, I'm out there doing all kinds of things and I'm, not, and I'm not getting caught. Well, to an unbeliever, the same thing happens. He's out doing all kinds of things and the wrath of God is not upon him. He is not getting caught. And he, he feels like he's getting away with something. And, and he feels that, that there is no wrath of God. But the wrath of God is going to bloom. It's going to bloom. It has bloomed. It bloomed at the cross. You know, and this really frustrated the old prophets. Just about all of them. David, David just couldn't, couldn't understand why the wicked prospered. He asked God, why does the wicked prosper? Another time David says, God, remember your covenant. He accused God of not remembering his covenant uh, to, the, to Israel. We're being persecuted by these wicked people. God, please remember your covenant. And Isaiah, uh, uh, the, the same thing. Uh, David says, uh, God, paraphrasing very loosely, don't you see what's happening in the dark places of the earth? Can't, well, aren't you going to do anything about it? That had to be by the Holy Spirit because David had never been to the dark places of the earth. We can go today to these dark regions where there's total corruption. Man is man, and the wrath of God is upon man. But the wrath of God is upon all unrighteousness and ungodliness. We have a term. Uh, we don't believe we have a term. Uh, uh, of, uh, this is so inhuman. This is so inhuman. Uh, the Third Reich, the, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, the whole thing with, with all the concentra concentration camps and all the killings. Uh, we read in the, our papers about the, about the mistreatment of children, the mistreatment of babies. That's an inhuman act. No, it's just totally human. It's, it's so natural. We're wicked to the core. And the wrath of God is going to bloom. The wrath of God has bloomed at the cross. And the wrath of God is going to bloom. It is, it is presently against. The wrath of God is now presently against all ungodliness and, unwicked, and unrighteousness. But the, 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 the wrath is coming in the future. That bloom is going to bloom. Picture a dam. In the water, the wrath of God is behind this dam, and the dam, the dam is God's God's long suffering. There's going to come a day when everybody's going to get even. There's going to come a day when David gets his way. There's going to come a day when David sees the wicked's end. That's what finally settled it for David. He could not understand why God prospered the wicked until he saw their end. And there's going to come an end. Now I want to do something right now that everyone tells me you're not supposed to do. It's a very boring thing to do, uh, but I want to do it. I want to read a whole lot of scripture uh, to make my point. Then we'll get back in, into this. Let's go to, to Revelation chapter 18. Now, it really doesn't matter, as we're turning there, it really doesn't matter what your belief is on, on the Revelation. It doesn't matter if you're a pre-mill or post-mill or past-mill or post millennialist or all millennialist or dispensationist. Or, or what? Either this is literal and be taken literally, or it's symbolic in all oh, the horribleness of the symbol. Either way, we can see God, God 
judging this world. In chapter 1 of verse 8, of chapter 18, verse 1 rather, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and, and the earth was illumined with his glory. I, I believe that personally to be Christ. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Babylon, and all, all the, the thinkers and the, the teachers agree pretty much to this, that Babylon is the religious, cultural, economic age. It is the world. It's what you and I understand as the world system. Verse 2, and he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And she has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of here, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and that you may not receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she is paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her, to the degree that she has glorified herself and lived sinuously, to the same degree, give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. Uh, so true of our day. For this reason, in one, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning, famine, and she will be burned with fire, and the, Lord, and the Lord God who judged her is strong. And the kings of the earth who commit acts of immorality and live sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance because of the fear of the torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in, in one hour your judgment has come. <clears throat> and the merchants of the earth, the merchants of the earth, weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory. And every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron or marble and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, cargoes of horses, chariots, slaves and human lives. And the fruit that you long for has gone from you and all things were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. The merchant of these things will become rich from her, will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. pearls. For in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as making their living by the sea stood at a distance. And were crying out as they saw the smoke of the burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their hands and were crying out, weeping and mourning, and saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who have ships see become rich by her wealth. For in one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. The wrath of God is coming. And a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus would Babylon the great be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sound of the harpists and musicians, and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in, any, uh, in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. <clears throat> For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been slain on the earth. After these things, I heard, as it were, a loud voice of a great multitude, that's you and I, <clears throat> in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power. Belong to our God. David is going to get his way. 
the wrath of God is going to be poured out on all ungodliness and unrighteousness. There's coming a day. God is not going to wink at our sins forever. And if you do not identify here, then you, then with, with this, if you don't see yourself in yourself as a common sinner, there's no way that you can ever understand and appreciate God's uncommon grace. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. That's toward God. Tell you what, we live in the 20th century, I know that. And things have changed, haven't they? Well, we, we don't live like they did in the first century. And there's an awful lot people say in Scripture that does not apply to us today because we live in a whole different world than back then. And I don't agree that Scripture does not apply, but I do agree that we live in a whole different world than they do back then. Things are a lot different now than when the Bible was written. But there's one thing that, may, that remains constant. Whether you live 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, or 2,000 years from now, one thing remains constant, and that is man is in rebellion against God. That's just it. And man is going to be judged for that. There is coming a day. The wrath of God is coming against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. The first word ungodliness has to do with man's rebellion against God. And because man rebels against God, he is then unrighteous to his fellow man. To prove that, you don't have to go to Scripture. All you have to do is go to the history books or to your local newspaper. We are an unkind people. We are a human people, and we do horrible human acts. God is hate, and the wrath of God is coming. I was in a Bible study years and years ago, and a real smart fellow came up to me. He was, he was real smart. I got to know him pretty well. Didn't like him much, but he, he, had a, he had a mind. And he said, Larry, he said, you believe in a little hell? I said, yes, I do. He said, well, do you believe in a little fire? And I said, well, I, I just, I'm not sure about that. I don't know if there's a little hell, a little fire in a hell or not. But I promise you one thing. Whatever's there, those who are there will believe it to be a fire. They will think it's a fire. You see, I have a little bit of problem. We won't get into this opinion now. I have a little bit of problem with a little hell because there will be no bodies. What good is a fire to a soul? Fire cannot hurt my soul. Fire hurts my body. I kind of think, but this is an opinion. <clears throat> that the scriptures are trying to teach, the scriptures are teaching that my soul will be going through such anguish just as my body would if I were over a fire. So to be honest with you, I don't know if I believe in a literal fire in hell or not. Do I believe that there's really a place called hell? And yes, I do. I don't know where it's at. Way off somewhere we don't know, but I, I do believe that. But he asked me that, and I said, well, I don't know about a literal fire, but, but I promise you that those who are there are going to believe it's a literal fire. He said, well, do you believe in the immor immortality of the soul? I said, yes, I do. I believe that man lives forever. You'll never cease from existing. As I said a few weeks ago, if you cut off my arm, I'm still Larry Horton. If you cut off my legs, I'm still Larry Horton. And if you kill this body and put it to the grave to rot, I'm still Larry Horton. That does not change who I am. And I'm going to, and Larry Horton, whom I know, is either going to spend eternity in heaven with God or eternity in hell. He says, well, then you being a human, believe in a literal fire or a literal hell with fire, and you believe in a soul, even you would not put an animal, we won't even talk about human beings, would not even put an animal in an open fire, a live animal in a fire. He thought he had me. I said, oh, yes, I would. He said, you mean to tell me that you would actually roast a live animal and all that pain in a fire? I said, I most certainly would. I said, if a dog had rabies or if a, if a herd of dogs had rabies and they were attacking my loved ones in my house, I love my kids, I love my wife, I'd roast them in a minute. If a bunch of rats were coming in, the blue bonnet plague, and was attacking my house, I would set my whole house on fire and I'd want every one of them to die. And you said, sir, that you're not even going to talk about human beings, but I'll tell you this, I'll do the same thing with human beings. If some pervert came into my house and was trying to, to to harm my children, my wife, I would, I would get them killed just as quick as I could. Why? Because I love my family. I love my family. And God loves his church. Christ loves his bride. And he's going to purify this old place so we can come back here and live here. And in doing so, he's going to, he's going to do away with all of heaven and all of earth because God is just. And his wrath is going to be, it's got to come in order for you and I to live.
because he loves us, he's going to get rid of all the pestilence. He's going to get rid of all the rats. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Man gets a truth and he, he puts it down. And this, we are real bad about this in the church. We take part of the scripture and we preach it and the rest of it we put down. We suppress it. We put it down. We don't give the truth. Man is so smart. Man is so brilliant before God. Builds a, builds a tower all the way to God. He was going to be God. Adam decided he was going to be God. And we're all so brilliant. We suppress God's truth and preach our own truth. And the wrath of God is coming on that because here is the first reason why God's wrath is going to be poured out upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness. The first reason is because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. Now, we're not talking about salvation, folks. We're talking about judgment. Don't take from that that man is born into this world with a little bit of light with a divine light that someday when he passes the age of innocence, he can either turn to turn to God or, or turn away from God. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about how God is going to judge people. And God is going to judge firstly because he made himself evident in them. It, it, there's not that every person that has ever been born knows there's a God. For since the creation of the world, his in, in, invisible attributes come up. God is invisible. God is spirit. No man has seen God at any time. Well, then how do we know there's a God? Because he is invisible, even though his, he, he's invisible, he has, he has made himself known. How? In creation. For since the creation of the world, invisible attributes, which are his eternal power and divine being, and we can change that uh, uh, to our, our everyday expressions, that he is and he's powerful. Every man born into this world knows two things about God that he exists, and that he's powerful. How do they know that? He has made himself known, having been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now, either the scriptures are correct, and the atheists are a liar, or the atheists are correct, and the scriptures are a liar. The man who says there is no God is a liar. I don't care. You can join any atheist group you want. It's all nonsense, because everybody in there is a liar. Because the scriptures tell me that every single person who's ever been born knows that there's a God. They, they know that there's a God, and they know that he's powerful. And they suppress that truth. They, they do away with that truth. They get away from that truth because they're ungodly, because they are rebellion against God. But all you have to do is look at the ocean to know that there's a God. All you have to do is look at the, a tree and know that there's a God. But mainly all you have to do is look at the body and know that there's a God. There can be no doubt in anybody's mind that there is a supreme being when we just look at our own bodies, the way they function, good, not alive. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to God. Well, that, that's a shame. You know, I, I suppose there are a couple of things in this life that I care more about. Than, than thankfulness, I suppose, but it just goes all over me when I do something for somebody and they're not thankful. I know I shouldn't be that way, but but that that's the way I am. You know, we're supposed to have died on the cross. We're not to have any rights. I understand that, but in my flesh, I still get I still get very upset with my my kids, my family, people that work for me, people I work with. When I when I sacrifice to do some good and they're not thankful. Everybody's out trying to work to get to heaven, work to be good, and they're not. That they, they that they're just they don't have any any understanding. It's much like someone coming over and killing my son. They like coming into my house and and killing my son. Coming back next week and wanting to mow my lawn. They got it. We got to deal with the son first, and 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 we are so unthankful. <laughs> we are so unthankful. God God gives us uh, so much. The atheist, the very bread that he uses to say there is no God. He should fall down on his knees and thank God for the bread. The very bread that the Gnostic or the agnostic uses to say, I don't know if there is a God. Should fall down on his knees and thank God for the very bread to say such a thing. Isaiah 1, verses 2 and 3, Listen, O heavens, and hear a words, for the Lord speaks. Sons, I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. 
An ox knows its owner, and a donkey is, a, is its master's manager, manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Good not alive. A dog knows of your master. A dog is thankful for, for your love. And we stand before God as unbelievers, and we do not give thanks to God for who he is. And many times in our old nature, we stand before God and look at our circumstances, and we're not thankful. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, been understood through what has been made, what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor God, honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, I tell you guys, if you don't start with God, you're going to believe in something. I, I promise you, you're going to believe in something. An atheist has a systematic theology. An atheist can tell you why he doesn't believe in God. You're going to believe in something. And so if you start, if you start putting down, suppressing, stepping on, doing away with the truth of God, you're going to come up with something else. And it's just going to be so stupid. And you're going to think you're so right on. I've heard all kinds of stupid stuff. Had a long talk with a fellow down in Dallas about the soul. And we got into heaven. And I asked him, well, do you believe it's a little heaven? Yeah, uh, there's a heaven, but but we got it all backwards. We, 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 heaven is not made up of individual souls. Somehow at death, we all of us become one soul. There's just one soul, and we go, one soul goes to heaven or bless or whatever. Nietzsche, the, the, the philosopher of World War II Germany, whom was Hitler's guru, Hitler was motivated by two things. One was the voice inside his head, and the number two was the philosopher Nietzsche. And before he said God is dead, he said either man is a blunder of God or God is a blunder of man. Yeah, it's just so foolish. It's just so, so asinine. He believed that. Then he says God is dead. He believed that. It's just darkness. There's darkness. If you do not worship God, if you do not you do not honor God if you do not bow down and 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 accept what God has, accept who God is. Uh, you're not going to stay in a state of 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 evenness here. You're going to continually be gone down. God's going to darken your mind more and more and more and more. Everybody that's been born into this world knows that there is a God, and they know, they know that He's powerful. They know it because they can see His creation. They suppress it. They put it down. And God darkens their foolish minds and, and they, they become blind speculators of, of nonsense. That's a judgment of God. The reason we have philosophers in the world is a judgment of God. It's the wrath of God being poured out. A philosopher is nothing more than a minister of the judgment of God. And I like to paraphrase verse 22, if you'll give me just a bit of liberty, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became philosophers. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 44 for a moment. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God beside me. And who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nations, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. I am God. Can you tell me how I made the world? Can you tell me how I established these nations back there in David's time, in Isaiah's day? Can you tell me what I'm doing today? Is there going to be a nuclear holocaust or not? I know. I am God. I, I, I'm before all things. I determine all things. You know what the future holds? I do. And yet, this is what you say. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? You are my witness. Is there any God beside me or is there any other rock I know of none. Those who fashion graven images are all of them futile. And their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witness fail to see or know so that they will put to shame. Even the own, their, own, their own clan doesn't know what you're talking about. Their own, their own witnesses don't know what the idols are all about. Who has fashioned a God or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame. For the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. 
let them tremble, and let them together be put to shame. You got this craftsman who makes a beautiful idol. And you fall down and worship the idol because you don't want to worship God who knows all things. And you're worshiping the product, not even of God. You're worshiping the product of man. And we do the same thing. We don't fall down and worship a piece of wood, but we worship people. We think Ronald Reagan's going to save the world. It's a mere man. The man shapes into iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. And he also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in a house. Boy, I have it. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees in the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a, a god and worships it. He makes it a graven in image and falls down before it. Isaiah is saying, you got this fellow, he goes out there and plants a tree. God brings rain, the tree grows up, grows out, cuts the branches off of it, cuts the branch off of it. Half of it, he cuts up and he puts it in a fire. He burns it and he cooks bread on it. And he's nourished by it. The other half, the same piece of wood, he makes into a graven image and falls down and worship it, worships it. What utility, what darkness, what stupidity, what foolishness. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 18 for a moment. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. There's only one truth. There's only one wisdom. That is the truth of the word of God. Now, we all know, if I can apply this just a bit, we don't have to worry about knowing that there's a God because of creation. We're way beyond that. And if I may talk just as believers, there is no truth outside of the scriptures that will do anything for philosophical truth, a cultural truth. That there, there is nothing that will that except will cause us harm. God is going to pour out his wrath as far as on the ungodly, on upon the of the world. Is it's coming. It's it's not something that 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 God will not do. You will be judged by God if you are not a believer. If you are a believer, it's, you've been judged already. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, that's towards God, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, put it down, in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, which are his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And, and I was going to read and close, but one more, I'd like to get one more illustration of this right here. People say there is no God because they cannot see God. God is invisible. God is spirit. If I, if I may embarrass all of you just for a minute, how many believe that there's an atom? Atom, a T. With an, is there an atom or is there not? Well, I'll tell you this. No one has ever seen an atom at any time. And the, the scientists tell us that because of its very nature, but it never will. If you had a barn out in the field and you just descended thousands of baseballs, luminous baseballs on this barn, and it was dark, you'd kind of make out the shape of the barn just with baseballs, couldn't you? Bouncing off of them. Kind of tell there's a barn there. But if you did the same thing with a with a with a lamp, first baseball that hit it would knock it over. And then so then you couldn't see the lamp. That's the way an atom is. The force of light that'll hit an atom will knock it over. So scientists tell us we're never going to be able to see an atom. So I'm in class. And a professor tells me that I'm going to be, we're going to be studying about atoms. 
And I said, well, there's no such thing. He said, well, how do you know there's no Adam? And I said, because I don't see one. You can't prove to me that there's an Adam because I don't see one. He says, have you ever heard of Hiroshima? You can't tell me there's not an Adam. There's the results of the Adam. So come test time, I come and I present my paper that there is no Adam. What, 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 what choice does he have? He can say, boy, I tell you, Larry, that's a real good paper. You really did a good job with that, but I got to give you an F because you did not give me the answers I wanted. God has made it evident in this world that there is an Adam because we blew up Hiroshima with Adams. It takes a complete idiot not to believe in an Adam just because he can't see it. Well, in the same way, God created the universe. And it takes a complete idiot not to recognize that it was God that created it. Therefore, because of that, God suppresses the truth and leads this fellow into more and more darkness, into blind speculation, into futility. He becomes a philosopher or gets into philosophical thought, which is just a whole bunch of dribble, and the wrath of God is going to be upon all of it. That's the first case Paul presents. Man is without excuse. Every single person that winds up in hell is going to be in hell, first of all, because he did not recognize God because after he saw the creation. That's number one, Paul says. Now I got about 12, 13, 14 more of them to go, Judge. But this is the first one. I was fortunate that Larry understood grace as deeply as he did growing up because he was a pastor, even though he didn't do it full time. He always had a church or a Bible study. Unlike many other pastors' kids, however, he never made me feel pressured to behave better than everyone else because of his position. He just understood grace so deeply that I never felt like I was less than or that God was unhappy with me or that he was unhappy with me. He never made me feel that way. And that's a real blessing because I know it can be really hard for pastors' kids to have to be held to a higher standard than their peers just because they don't want to make their families look bad or their parents look bad or the parents care more about their reputation than they do about what's really going on with their kids. When I was about 12 or 13, maybe, or 14. My brother and I and a childhood friend who was going to this church in the 80s when Dad was preaching where these sermons are coming from, um, the friend of mine was stay spending the night, and the three of us got the bright idea at 2 a.m. that the best place for us to be at 2 a.m. in the morning was in the streets of Moore, just wandering about the streets of Moore. My mom had woken up late in the night and discovered that none of us were there. So she put my dad on the case and she sent my dad out to go find us. And when he found us, I was sitting in the middle of an intersection in our town. And he comes with, we had the big blue conversion van and he drives up and he looks at us, my brother, my friend and I, and he's like, get in the van. And he drove us home. He didn't He didn't look angry. He didn't yell at us. He didn't lecture us. And uh, the next day, you know, mom was pretty upset. And he, she had every right to be. I mean, she wakes up and her kids are not in the house. At least half of her kids aren't in the house. But um, dad just, I remember him saying, well, I was just so glad we found you. And that was it. That was that. So I um, just had that cute little story to recount um, and still just uh, still have such fond memories of growing up with dad as, as dad and not as a pastor that I was always having to live up to and perform for. Again, you can email me if you want to let me know how you're feeling about the podcast at thetimelessgospel at gmail.com. I'll end this episode with Paul Fye's rendition of Amazing Grace played on the largest pipe organ in the Netherlands.
Thank you for listening to the Timeless Gospel Podcast.